A Mexican Navy King Air 350i went down in Texas during a medical mission, killing six people. And before anyone jumps to conclusions about why this happened, there are three things we need to get right or everything that follows will be wrong. What kind of flight this actually was, what kind of aircraft this actually is, and what we genuinely do not know yet. That's why I want to make this video to carefully set the foundation so that when real facts emerge, we're prepared to understand them. This is William and welcome to Black Box Analyst. Let's start with the most important piece of context. This aircraft was operated by the Mexican Navy. That alone changes the analytical frame. This was not a US Part 135 air ambulance. It wasn't a charter flight, it wasn't a corporate repositioning leg, and it wasn't a training or ferry operation. It was a government operated aircraft conducting a cross-border humanitarian medical transport mission. Why does that distinction matter? because government medical flights operate under a different structure than civilian commercial aviation. They follow different standard operating procedures. They often carry mixed crews, flight crew, medical personnel, possibly support staff, each with defined roles. And they coordinate differently with air traffic control, border authorities, and receiving medical facilities. If you misclassify the operation, every conclusion that follows will be wrong. There's also a human reality worth acknowledging without dramatizing it. This flight existed because someone on board needed urgent medical care. That fact doesn't excuse anything, but it does provide context. It reminds us this wasn't a casual trip. It was a mission with purpose, time pressure, and responsibility, the kind that government crews train for routinely. Getting this classification right isn't just academic. It sets the boundaries for what comparisons are valid and which ones aren't. Next, let's talk about the airplane itself, because this is where public narratives often drift off course. The Beechcraft King Air 350i is a pressurized twin-engine turboprop with a long, well-documented operational history. It's fully IFR capable, widely used around the world by governments, military units, and special mission operators. Surveillance, transport, med support, this platform does all of that every day. Operationally, this is not a light aircraft in the way that term is often used casually. It's a professional grade machine designed to operate in controlled airspace, in weather, under structured procedures. That matters because when people hear turboprop or see a smaller silhouette on a tracking map, there's a tendency to mentally downgrade the aircraft's capability. That instinct is misplaced here. Now let's talk about the crew. On flights like this, flight crew and medical personnel have distinct roles. The pilots fly the airplane, medical staff handle patient care, military rank does not equate to cockpit authority. Aviation procedures govern decision making in the flight deck, not rank hierarchy. What we don't know yet, and this is important, is who was pilot flying and who was pilot monitoring. We don't know how cockpit tasks were divided, what experience levels looked like, or what the recent duty cycle had been. And that's okay. At this stage, there's no evidence that this aircraft or this crew category was operating outside normal professional standards. Saying anything more specific than that right now would be guessing. Before getting into the details, it's important to draw a clear line. What follows is based on publicly available radar data, ADSB tracking, and environmental reports. This information helps us understand where the aircraft was and the conditions it was operating in. It does not explain why the accident happened and it shouldn't be treated as a causal narrative. Public radar and ADSB data show the aircraft established on a curved overwater track toward Galveston Shoals International Airport during the terminal phase of flight. The final portion of the track places the aircraft almost entirely over Galveston Bay. Operationally, that environment matters. Over water, especially at low altitude, visual references are sparse. There are no roads, buildings, or terrain features to provide reliable depth cues, which increases reliance on instrument references. The geometry of the lateral track itself is consistent with radar vectoring or procedural alignment toward the airport. There is nothing in the track that suggests evasive maneuvering or erratic control inputs. That distinction matters because lateral track data shows where the aircraft was positioned, not what was happening inside the cockpit or why specific decisions were made. According to official briefings, air traffic control lost communication with the aircraft approximately 10 minutes before impact. 
Flight tracking data shows the aircraft continuing its descent towards Skulls before the ADS-B signal goes offline near the Galveston Causeway. Over water and at low altitude, ADS-B coverage degrades significantly. Receiver geometry and track smoothing can exaggerate turns or create misleading precision, so signal loss and track shape should not be interpreted as pilot intent or abnormal behavior. Weather conditions are another important piece of context. Multiple sources reported dense fog and very low visibility in the Galveston Bay area at the time of the approach, with visibility in some locations reduced to a few hundred yards or less. Fog over water presents a unique challenge. It reduces depth perception, distorts closure rate, and eliminates peripheral visual cues, often delaying visual references until very late in the approach. From a pilot workload perspective, this places a premium on disciplined instrument cross-check, strict adherence to approach minima, and a willingness to go around if the visual picture doesn't develop as expected. Weather here should be understood as a workload amplifier, not a cause. At this stage, it has not been publicly confirmed which navigational aids at Galveston Shoals were available and fully functional at the time of the approach, and that information will matter later in the investigation. Looking at the vertical profile and speed trend from ADS-B data provides context, but not diagnosis. The aircraft appears to have been operating in the 6 to 7,000 foot range during the latter portion of the en route phase, followed by a managed step-down descent toward the airport. Altitude remains relatively stable for several minutes before a more pronounced descent in the final segment, where ADS-B resolution rapidly degrades. Recorded ground speed shows a gradual reduction from roughly 140 to 145 knots toward approximately 95 to 110 knots near the final recorded points, with no obvious acceleration spikes. It's important to remember that ADS-B reports ground speed, not indicated airspeed. Coastal wind gradients and fog layers can significantly distort ground speed as a proxy for energy state. Without wind data, aircraft configuration, or power settings, approach stability cannot be determined from this chart alone. What the data suggests is a managed descent and deceleration, which is expected, not how that energy was managed inside the cockpit. The final ADS-B points occur very close to the surface, where public tracking data is least reliable. Update intervals stretch, receiver coverage degrades, and altitude accuracy diminishes. The final seconds of flight are often compressed or incomplete. If a sudden event occurred near the surface, ADS-B data is frequently incapable of capturing it with sufficient detail, which is why investigators do not rely on public tracking data for causal conclusions. In the immediate aftermath, two survivors were recovered and transported to local hospitals. The response involved multiple agencies, including the FAA, NTSB, U.S., Coast Guard, and state and local emergency services. Civilian rescue efforts also played a role, including a local boater who assisted survivors in foggy conditions, highlighting how quickly this situation unfolded. As of now, there has been no official determination of cause. The status of any cockpit voice or flight data recording equipment has not been publicly disclosed. Air traffic control transcripts have not been released, and the operational status of approach aids at Galveston remains unconfirmed. Aircraft configuration and cockpit task distribution are also unknown. That absence of information is normal at this stage. Right now, we have environmental context and public flight data. What we do not yet have is the evidence required to explain why this accident happened. And until that evidence emerges, discipline matters more than certainty. This flight profile frames the accident, but it does not explain it. To move beyond this, investigators will need data that ADS-B cannot provide. Cockpit audio, aircraft configuration, navigation aid status, and detailed wreckage examination. That process takes time, and early certainty in aviation accidents is usually wrong. As verified information is released, this analysis will evolve. And when it does, we'll revisit this flight with evidence, not assumptions. That's how real understanding is built. Thank you for watching. I'll come back when more details emerge. Fly safe.